So um, thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, it is really my great pleasure to, to wish everybody a good morning, good afternoon or good day, depending on where in the world um, you tune in or when you watch this, um, what will also be a recording. Um, so welcome to our next live event um, for ASBS 2020. The previous days have been really exciting, I believe, and um, hopefully you've had a chance to look at our YouTube channel. The link is in the chat if you haven't had a look yet. Um, we have, as we mentioned in our um, opening session, almost 40 speakers this year. And all of the sessions that are live will be recorded and also uploaded. And um, there's also a whole array of other talks on our channel already posted. If you have, during today's talk, any questions or um, would like to pose them, at the end of this um, uh, talk from Dr. Miller, please submit them in the Q&A, not in the chat. It's always hard to find the chat um, um, uh, questions there, but please submit them in the Q&A and we'll make sure to ask them at the end. With that, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Jack Miller. He obtained his bachelor in physics from the University of Michigan and a master's in physics from San Francisco State University, and then received his PhD in experimental relativistic heavy iron physics at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory from UC Davis. He is a research professor, a consultant at NASA Ames Research Center, and a technical consultant at the NASA Langley Research Center. His interests, and he will obviously tell us a lot more about that himself, are in the interactions of galactic cosmic radiation, solar particles, in both matter and biological organisms, and mitigation of radiation effects in, human, in humans on, in space including also the development of um, spacecraft and habitation radiation shielding. His work has, evolved, has involved experiments at acceler acceler <laughs> accelerators, excuse me, at Berkeley, Brookhaven, the National Institute of Radiology, Ra Radiological Sciences in Chiba, Japan, and Loma Linda University. More recently, his interests include astrobiology, and in particular, comparing extreme environments on Earth to learn about possibilities for life elsewhere. But also, more terrestrial questions interest him and his team that include hadron therapy for cancer, basic uh, physics-based methods for enhancing um, effectiveness of th therapeutic beam and development of facilities for light ion therapy in the US. Dr. Miller has a long-standing interest in fostering multidisciplinary and multinational collaborations um, and has um, helped to develop a beamline for radiation biology at the Brookhaven National Laboratory alternating gradient synchrotron, which has led to the construction of the NASA Space Radiation Laboratory. Now a dedicated facility for research in space radiation, I'm sure all of you have heard of it before. He's also the co-editor of the Elsevier journal, Life Sciences and Space Research, LSSR. And I would highly recommend anybody in this field to keep this one on their radar and have a look at it. Today, he's joining us from California and sharing his talk on space radiation and its impact on human exploration of the solar system. And with that, Jack, I will turn it over to you and thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks, Chris. Um... Uh, thanks everyone for listening, watching, wherever you are. Um, if you're in Sydney, I strongly urge you to go back to bed and uh, watch this on YouTube. Um, so uh, I'm going to be speaking on um, several topics related to space radiation um, and its impact on uh, exploration of the solar system. Um, First, the space radiation environment, a brief survey of the space radiation environment. Some of its health effects and countermeasures. And resources that are available for, for research, with the emphasis on uh, ground resources, uh, ground-based resources. And this is going to be uh, a survey talk. Um, so I'll be um, uh, briefer than I would uh, then I will be in a full course, but uh, hopefully just give you a, a, a good overview. The emphasis will be on 
physics. I'm a physicist, not a biologist, but I will touch on some biology issues. So just to set the stage, uh, as many of you may, may know, um, radiation doses on Earth are very modest. The average terrestrial background, whoops, the average terrestrial background is uh, between three and four millisievert per year. Uh, a chest, chest x-ray would give you about uh, 0.4 millisievert. Moving into space, the Apollo mission is approximately one, one week long outside the US magnetic field. The Apollo astronauts incurred doses of about 10 millisievert. On the ISS, the doses are between 100 and 200 millisievert per year. And projected Mars mission of about three years, astronauts would get are estimated to be getting about 1,000 millisievert. And I'm going to be addressing the um, issue of solar particle events. And as you can see here, uh, the doses there are extremely high, and they do, they do present a particular problem for space exploration. Um, national radiation um, agencies uh, set dose limits. In the US, the dose limit is uh, one millisievert per year for the general public in excess of background. Radiation workers have a dose limit of 50 millisievert per year. NASA astronauts who are considered radiation workers in low Earth orbit on the ISS, uh, they have a much higher limit of 500 millisievert per year and a career limit uh, between 1,000 and 4,000 millisievert depending on age and sex. So the space radiation environment, uh, broadly defined, it consists of trap radiation, so radiation trapped by the Earth's magnetic field, the Ben Allen belts, solar particles, and galactic cosmic radiation. And I'll take these one at a time. So the trapped particles in the Earth's radiation belts um, consist of both electrons and protons, electrons between 0.1 and 10 MeV, so easily stopped by modest thicknesses of material, and protons of between 10 and 100 MeV, which are uh, somewhat more penetrating. Now the ISS uh, orbits at about uh, between around 250, 230 miles, 400 kilometers or so, and are inside the innermost radiation belt. So there is radiation up there, but um, not, as, uh, not as intense as, as uh, astronauts would experience uh, inside the outer belts or beyond Earth's orbit or, or Earth's magnetic field. Solar energetic particles originate primarily from solar flares, which are um, sporadic, sudden releases of energy. The time scale is typically on the order of seconds to minutes and uh, consists of both photons and uh, charged particles. Now, Coronal mass ejections, or CME, uh, occur once every few days at solar minimum, and more frequently uh, during when the sun is active at solar max. The time scale for emission is uh, on the order of um, tens of hours to a few days, and they consist primarily of protons between 10 and 100 MeV. Galactic cosmic radiation originate out, originates outside the solar system. Uh, in supernova explosions, as you can see in the background, this very nice picture from the Chandra X-ray Observatory of the supernova Cassiopeia A. Uh, when they get to uh, the solar system, they're isotropic. They appear to come from everywhere. They do come from everywhere. They're modulated by the intergalactic magnetic field. They're very high energy, in excess of 100 MeV per nucleon. They consist of protons, alpha particles, or helium nuclei, and heavier nuclei, all the way up uh, throughout the periodic table in, within the solar system and modulated by the solar wind. So when the sun is most active, uh, GCR tends to be lower. When the sun is least active, uh, the GCR is somewhat higher. Uh, the maximum fluence at solar minimum, when they're highest, is about four per square centimeter per second. Now in low Earth orbit, uh, the principal radiation hazard, as I, as I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, uh, is from trapped particles. And uh, the intensity is relatively low, but there is a concern that these particles could produce late effects 
uh, such as late cancers. Um, more recently, uh, there, there have been increased, increased number of studies on cardiovascular effects and effects on the central nervous system. And in the lower right, you can see um, a radiation map. The blue, blue band is the, um, uh, the orbital path, uh, sort of integrated over all the orbital paths of the ISS. And the um, green and yellow and orange blob is the, um, the South Atlantic anomaly where protons, uh, the, the proton flux is the highest. And that's where the astronauts on the ISS get most of their dose during passages through the SAA. Uh, the approximate dose on the ISS is uh, between 100 and 200 millisievert per year. And I should make a note here that um, radiation physicists, radiation biologists sometimes use the, the, the term dose rather loosely. What we actually measure in space is the absorbed dose, so the energy uh, actually deposited by radiation in the unit volume. But to study biological effects, one needs to weight the absorbed dose, uh, in, and that's done in various ways. Uh, if you see a unit gray or rad, that's absorbed dose. If you see REM or sievert, that's dose that, that's weighted. Uh, sometimes it's uh, dose equivalent, equivalent dose, effective dose. Those are all um, weighted doses uh, that are weighted in different ways. The countermeasures uh, in low Earth orbit are relatively straightforward, operational, meaning limiting the, the amount of time astronauts can spend, out, uh, can spend in space, um, adding uh, some shielding, modest amounts of shielding within the, uh, the ISS in addition to the shielding they get from, this, from the vehicle walls. Um, and monitoring astronaut doses along with that, so uh, dose symmetry. Astronauts on EVAs, in case you're wondering, get about, um, they get about a day's worth of dose in an eight-hour EVA. So, so certainly that's, um, astronauts who do large numbers of EVAs need to be monitored more carefully. And as I've mentioned before, astronauts in low Earth orbit are, are classified as radiation workers. Uh, I'm not sure what, that, uh, what the standard is outside the U.S., but in the U.S., as I said, the dose limit is 500 millisievert per year. And I mentioned shielding. Um, it turns out that the, uh, uh, because of the conformation of the Earth's or the, or for, because of the profile of the Earth's magnetic field, um, when you're at higher inclinations, Mir was at 57 degrees inclination, the ISS is at 51.6 degrees. Most shuttle flights are 28.5. You get more of a dose equivalent um, and the ISS from GCR HCE. And HCE is a term I'm gonna throw around. It just stands for highly charged and energetic nuclei, which is what the GCR are. And one way of, radi of reducing radiation dose is by adding shielding. And a project that my team at LBL worked on some years ago was uh, measuring the effect of uh, polyethylene shielding uh, as shielding against GCR. And based on our findings, uh, there was some polyethylene shielding added to the ISS, uh, the ISS sleep stations. This is uh, from, this photo is from quite uh, some time ago. I'm not sure if that shielding is still there. Um, hopefully it is. Exploration missions, so as defined as missions beyond the Earth's magnetic field, which protects from a large uh, portion of the GCR. Um, the dose is gonna be somewhat higher, approximately 300 millisievert per year. And the radiation hazards are twofold. Um, GCR uh, for the late effects, similar to the effects that one would experience in low Earth orbit, but perhaps more, more severe. And then um, acute effects, meaning uh, radiation that's sufficiently intense that it could be crude disabling to, uh, to an astronaut. And those would come from solar particle events. So as solar particle events, or SPE, you can get doses. I'm going to move this square that's on my screen. I don't know if it's on yours as well. but So you can see, um, you can get doses of 1,000 millisievert per hour. So the, the dose you'd get on a mission to Mars in a single hour. So the, the effects are acute, 
they're mission critical, meaning that, that, that they could uh, they'd be a total showstopper for the mission, but they are of limited duration. Tens, tens, of, tens to maybe 100 hours. Uh, so the countermeasures are actually relatively straightforward. You can plan to go at times when the sun is less active, and you can add um, shielding. So, uh, it, so the upper plot uh, is probably familiar to, to most of you. It's a plot, a time plot of the um, solar activity, so the 11 year solar cycle. So um, it's generally assumed that when we go, when we plan exploration missions, they would be planned at the at solar minimum when GCR activity is uh, when GCR is relatively high, but the risk of solar particle events is relatively low. But of course, there's no guarantee. So the plans for exploration vehicles will include um, so-called storm shelter, so a relatively heavily shielded area in the vehicle to which the astronauts can retreat for the say the one to three day duration of, of an SPE. Um, for astronauts on the moon or on Mars, uh, shielding would be in the form of um, lunar or Martian regolith, uh, putting a shelter up against uh, uh, say a cliff or even in a shallow crater, uh, just a, anything that can reduce the, uh, the SPE and keeping in mind that the astronauts don't have to remain in that shelter for very long. So now to GCR, which is gonna be the main source of radiation risk, um, chronic radiation risk uh, in exploration missions beyond the Earth's magnetic field. So GCR consists of a small number of electrons and positrons, but most of it is atomic nuclei, 98%. And of that 98%, most is protons. Uh, second most alpha particles are helium nuclei, and the rest heavy ions, high, highly charged and energetic particles. And here's a, a plot of um, the composition uh, at a selected energy, about 2 GeV, 2 billion electron volts per nucleon, uh, versus, versus nuclear charge. And what you can see here, if I can try and move my cursor, as you can see, and this is a log plot, the abundance drops off the edge of the table above iron. And of course, it's relatively low for, for iron, even for iron, but it really drops off the edge of the table after iron. The reason iron is the most abundant has to do with the astrophysics of supernovas, and it's an interesting topic, but one that I won't go into here. And again, the radiation hazards are late cancers, effects on the central nervous system. And again, there's been an increasing number of investigations on effects to the cardiovascular system. Fortunately, we have a pretty good idea of the radiation, very good idea actually, of the radiation environment uh, outside low Earth orbit. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here. I just wanted to illustrate some of the, uh, some of the work that's been done. Um, uh, there are radiation monitors on the ISS. Radiation mon there's a radiation monitor in orbit around the in lunar orbit, on the lunar reconnaissance orbiter. Uh, Mars Odyssey in orbit around Mars has mapped the cosmic ray environment on Mars. And the um, MSL, the Mars Science Laboratory, uh, actually did some very nice work measuring the radiation environment uh, between Earth and Mars during its transit to Mars, and now on the surface through the Curiosity rover. So why are GCR an issue? Well. Um, life on Earth evolved, uh, I think as one of the speakers the other day pointed out, we evolved in an environment of 1G. And we also evolved in an environment that's relatively shielded from, uh, from radiation, but especially in particular highly ionizing radiation. And um, so we've not, we've not evolved um, a sophisticated defense mechanism, biological defense mechanism against that kind of radiation. And in fact, a single particle traversal from a heavy ion, even though they're relatively rare, it can kill or even worse, severely damage a cell because misrepair can lead to cancer, as all you biologists are well aware. Okay, in this plot, the, the, green, the green bars are the, it's a log plot again, the green bars show the relative contribution of charged particles uh, from 
charges one up to charge 26 iron. But when you weight it by um, energy deposition, which is what governs absorbed dose, you get the red bars and you can see the iron, uh, the heavier ions become much more prominent uh, relative to, the, to their numbers, more prominent in effect. And when you further weight by biological, whatever, by the, by the measure of biological effect that can get you to dose equivalent, you can see that, that iron all the way on the right is, is uh, um, fairly significant compared to the dose from protons. I'm just going to digress for a moment into the radiotherapy world. Uh, this, uh, this plot shows the, uh, it's a plot of energy deposition for various types of particles. And as you can see, and most of you probably know, photons, x-rays and gamma rays and neutrons deposit their energy um, at a relatively, relatively constant rate um, throughout, the, the, throughout the body. But char heavy charge particles, such as protons, and in this case, a carbon therapy beam, they deposit uh, almost all their energy in a very small volume at the end of their range. And here's a, another illustration of that. On the left, um, this is a, a cell that's been stained for DNA damage. And you can see in the, on the top left, gamma rays are relatively, the damage is relatively diffuse. Silicon, charge 14, you get a track, uh, discernible track structure. And then for three iron particles at the bottom, you get a very dense track structure. And on the right, you can see this illustrated in another way. This is a nuclear emulsion photograph uh, going from left to right, charge one up through charge 26. And you can see at the bottom the uh, representative dimension of the cell. And you can see the intense energy deposition by heavy ions. And, um, these uh, the, the threads extending out from the central track are delta rays that um, I believe Dr. Rosenfeld referred to in his talk the other day, high energy electrons. And I'm gonna just uh, show you a very little bit of biology, which is about all the biology I know, but uh, late effects are produced in two primary ways, direct effects. So heavy ion tracks producing single or double strand breaks in DNA, and indirect effects where they produce hydroxyl radicals in the uh, surrounding medium and those radicals can migrate to DNA and cause damage. Okay, here's one of the um, very interesting piece of evidence, direct piece of, pieces of evidence that we have of this, of this damage. Uh, the, um, uh, this is the so-called light flashes that have been observ observed by astronauts both in low Earth orbit, but especially beyond low Earth orbit, the Apollo astronauts. The upper left is actually a photo of an experiment that was carried out on Apollo 17. That's astronaut Ron Evans wearing a hood, where they tried to coll correlate the light flashes that the astronauts observed with the, um, with the passage of heavy charged particles. The lower right are um, uh, artist conceptions based on the description of light flashes by uh, Apollo, Mir, shuttle astronauts. And the, uh, the source of these, um, of these light flashes is actually still, um, uh, has not been nailed down. There are various um, explanations, impacts on the retina, impacts elsewhere in the eye, impacts in the brain, uh, even Cherenkov radiation. And they continue to be studied. Uh, they actually were studied on the ground uh, the, the gentleman on the left in this picture is Dr. Cornelius Tobias, a pioneering radiation biophysicist who actually predicted uh, that light flashes would be observed back in 1952. Um, the gentleman uh, uh, in the middle is uh, Nobel laureate Edwin McMillan, who at the time was the director of Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And uh, this shows Dr. McMillan um, uh, placing his head in a low intensity nitrogen beam at the LBL. Bevelac. And in fact, uh, they did observe light flashes. And every time I show this picture, which I really like, I feel I need to caution you, do not try this at home. So to sum up GCR, they're not mission critical in the sense that they would be disabling uh, during, the, during the, the time of the mission, but there are potential serious late health effects. So the National Space Agency's 
uh, are obligated to attempt to mitigate for their radiation worker astronauts. Some of the countermeasures, uh, well, one is knowledge, just uh, performing the experiments that, that will uh, help you understand what the effects are. Um, but one of the countermeasures that, that's been discussed are radio protectants. So for example, uh, reactive oxygen species scavengers. The one that in my work, in my group's work, we've dealt with the most is radiation shielding. So trying to, trying to understand um, what feasible, the feasibility of adding shielding to exploration class vehicles. And that task is complicated because heavy ions, they're energetic, so they're highly penetrating. As I showed, they're highly ionizing. And they're also, they're composite, they're atomic nuclei. So they can fragment as they pass through materials. And that complicates both evaluation of risk and designing, designing the shielding. Compl it, the complication is because you need to understand uh, that the, uh, the complication uh, lies in that um, uh, an, an initially well understood, say mapped by the robotic missions, the initially well understood radiation field, uh, as it penetrates through the spacecraft wall, the equipment inside and the astronauts' bodies, it's gonna look very different because it's gonna fragment. And here's a little cartoon showing how that happens. Here's another very nice emulsion photograph. The particle, the incident particle is coming from the right and hitting a nucleus and then um, blowing, it, blowing it all to hell. And you see light, more lightly charged particles um, being emitted. Some more pictures. This is, uh, was taken in a device called the streamer chamber. Carbon ion coming in through the from the left and you can actually see three, uh, there's a magnetic field so the charges, so the particles are curved. And you can see three, the three helium nuclei coming out on the right. Here's a heavier ion fragmentation. This is a lanthanum nucleus fragmenting in a, a metal target. And an even heavier and more energetic um, interaction. This is a, a very high energy sulfur nucleus um, fragmenting in a target. This was taken at, uh, at CERN. So the net effect of shielding, both in dose and in uh, biological effect, is going to depend on um, a complicated interplay of fragmentation and energy loss. So as particles go through shielding, they're going to lose energy. Some of them may stop, but the ones that don't are going to fragment, and they're going to produce um, more, more penetrating, lightly charged ions. Um, it turns out you can do a very simple physics calculation that the, that the most effective materials, uh, most efficient by mass at both stopping and fragmenting radiation are hydrogenous materials. So that's, uh, that's one reason, the main reason why when people discuss shielding exploration class vehicles, they often look at using water, even wastewater uh, or polyethylene as shielding. Now, it's not feasible uh, to evaluate every possible material and every possible vehicle design uh, for every biological endpoint. So um, extensive work has been done for many years on radiation transport model calculations, and that's an iterative process. So uh, transport modelers will make a prediction for a particular ion, particular material. Uh, uh, we, go to, we go to particle accelerators, do the measurements, and we go back to the transport models, tell them where they were right, where they were wrong, where they were in between, and they tweak the models, and so on and so forth. Uh, here, th this is an old uh, plot, but it's actually a very nice, a very nice piece of work. Uh, Lisa Simonson and uh, collaborators at NASA Langley back in 1990, uh, when much less was known about the Martian about the Mars radiation field, but we had a pretty good idea of the Mars atmosphere. They did a calculation of um, uh, a canonical radiation field incident on the Mars atmosphere, transported it through the Mars atmosphere, which they estimated they took to be about 16 grams per square, per square centimeter of CO2, and then uh, through various thicknesses of Martian regolith. And um, what you can see on this plot, and I apologize, it's a little hard to see because of the, of the background, but um, 
the heavier ions get ranged out as you go deeper and deeper in the reglet. So for example, as, you're, as you'd be going deeper uh, uh, behind greater and greater thicknesses of shielding over a habitat, that would be shielded by Martian regolith. But the lighter particles, the protons and neutrons, uh, they, they increase. So you really, it, it, it shows that um, you, can shield, you can shield pretty well against the heavy ions, but th that's at the expense of increasing the dose from lighter ions and neutrons. And this is another plot um, showing uh, a transport calculation with, um, with various thicknesses of various materials of shielding, uh, showing uh, on the left um, a dose equivalent, on the right um, cell, cell transformation probability as a function of material thickness. And the green line indicates your break-even point. So anything above the green line uh, is bad. Anything below the green line is good. And what you can see, uh, you can see this is something most of you know, but or you probably all know, that uh, lead, which is the, what a lot of people think of as good radiation shielding, is not very effective. It's, in fact, it uh, has negative effectiveness against heavy ions. Uh, but lighter materials, water, lithium hydride, liquid methane, liquid hydrogen, are much more effective. Uh, the red line is, the, is aluminum spacecraft shielding. And what this shows, among other things, is that for some materials, including aluminum, modest thicknesses, so around 5 to 10 grams per square centimeter, can actually increase the risk from GCR. And some work that's been done much more recently has, has uh, confirmed that there is in fact a minimum, a local minimum, so that as you add shielding, um, you, get, uh, you get to a break even or you get to a, um, a point where it's most effective and then continuing to add shielding, it actually gets worse. So these curves would begin to turn up. So to sum up, shielding effectiveness depends very sensitively upon uh, the quality of the incident radiation, the shielding materials and thicknesses, and the biological endpoints you're considering. And so now I want to turn to research facilities, which I think uh, will be of particular interest to this audience. Uh, of course, in space, we have the ISS. We have biosatellites, such as the Russian Bion and Photon series. And we have CubeSats, such as BioSentinel, NASA's BioSentinel, which is due to be launched uh, this coming year. But I'm going to talk mostly about uh, the ground facilities. So here's a, a plot of um, the, the flux, the uh, abundance of cosmic rays as a function of kinetic energy. And the green band shows you the fortuitous um, overlap between the capabilities of terrestrial particle accelerators and the peak of the GCR spectrum. And some of the accelerators um, are, uh, some of the most prominent ones are NIRS HIMAC, uh, the Heavy Ion Medical Accelerator at Chiba, the NASA Space, NASA Space Radiation Laboratory at Brookhaven, CIS-18 at GSI, and there are, there are a number of others. Um, as particles, as charge, heavy charge particle therapy becomes more common worldwide, more accelerators are being built, uh, half a dozen or more in Japan, also in China, uh, Heidelberg, and, and elsewhere. And those facilities generally offer ions up to carbon, sometimes heavier, the therapy facilities do. And uh, they, they do, in most cases, offer beam time for basic physics and radiobiology research. Um, just a tiny bit of history, just for fun. This is a picture of uh, E.O. Lawrence's first cyclotron. Uh, it was essentially a benchtop experiment. You could hold it in the palm of your hand. Uh, 20 years later, um, accelerators had gotten to be about the size of the LBO Bevelac, um, which uh, is dear to my, to my heart. It's where I did most of my early work and much early work in radiation biology and uh, physics was done. Uh, it's now become a part parking lot and part biology laboratory. And then 20 years on, uh, accelerators have gotten quite a bit larger. Now, this is a, a satellite photograph 
of the accelerator complex at Brook, Brookhaven, um, which is still quite a bit smaller than CERN, uh, but uh, at the top is the Rel Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider, and uh, then in the middle is the accelerator complex consisting of the AGS, Booster Application Facility, and the NASA Space Radiation Laboratory, which is a, essentially a, a beam line off the booster application facility that offers uh, ions uh, through most of the periodic table, energy spanning the peak of the GCR spectrum, uh, doses um, between 0.1 and milligray and one gray and higher. They have a GCR simulator but I'm going to, uh, but I have that asterisk, I have an asterisk there because it's, uh, it has some limitations. They have an SPE simulator and they have um, very nice complement of beam sizes ranging from, well, a few centimeters, excuse me, from through 20 by 20 up to 60 by 60. You can't irradiate a cow, but you can get pretty close. And they have very nice facilities. This is a, a photograph showing you the, the scale of the uh, radi radiobiology and physics beam line, and they have a, a number of um, a very nice beam, beam line hardware uh, or an assortment of beam line hardware available. Um, and I've included the, uh, uh, their, uh, their website on the bottom if you're interested in contacting them for more information. Okay, here's a uh, schematic of HIMAC in Chiba. Uh, in the upper right is their laboratory for biology experiments, but there, one can also do physics experiments. Um, uh, these are done mostly at night and on the weekends when they're not treating patients, and they, uh, and they have a, a wide array of ions and energies available. And again, here's their website. And uh, I'm going through this rather quickly, but you can go back and, and YouTube and um, check this out if you want to. Uh, contact them. And then GSI, uh, schematic of their accelerator complex. They're closer uh, in what they offer to the NSRL. Um, ions throughout the periodic table, including uranium up to one GeV per nucleon, neon between 50 and 2000, or two GeV per nucleon, uh, high energy protons. And here again is their, uh, their website. And then, of course, there are the particle. Uh, the proton therapy facilities. And just as you can see from this map, there are now dozens worldwide. Um, and not all, but, uh, but many are available uh, for, um, uh, for basic physics and biology research. And there's a nice uh, summary of that in this paper by Marco Durante uh, from uh, 2017. So, um, if you do want to, well, we do want to re be able to reproduce space radiation, radiation on Earth, and how, um, how good are we at doing that? Well, as far as particle type, we can, we can get all of that. We can generate energy spanning the, uh, we can sample energy spanning the peak of the GCR spectrum. We can generate mixed fields. Um, Brookhaven especially has done some very nice things with, uh, um, generating uh, multiple, uh, multiple ion exposure or exposures to multiple ions and energies within a short period of time. Doses are, are easy uh, because accelerators are, are tuned to produce a much higher doses of radiation than one would see in space with the exception of SPE. The problem is, or, or the issue is dose rate. Typical mission dose rates, as I showed, and now I'm going back to absorb dose, so gray, on the order of 0.2 milligray per day on the ISS, somewhat higher if you're in uh, outside the Earth's magnetic field, so on exploration missions. But the minimum that you can feasibly or, or practically generate at accelerators, um, with the exception of microbeams, is um, around 0.1 to 0.2 milligray per second. So much higher dose rates, or so it's, it's much more difficult to generate, or not really feasible to generate space-like dose rates <clears throat> on the ground. So that leads to some challenges. So, so how do you simulate space radiation dose rates at accelerators? Well, you can go for single doses at the lowest possible intensity, but that's still higher than what you see in space. You can fractionate doses over, over days 
or weeks or even months. Uh, but again, the, the doses are relatively high. And you really can't get at dose rate dependent effects because the, the scale of the time scale of fractionation is wildly different from DNA repair time scales and, and time scales for effects such as bystander effects. Uh, what you can also do, and uh, the, the approach that's um, probably most promising, is that you can understand the mechanisms. And um, so you can use what you have to do the basic, basic biology and try and extrapolate um, from different model systems and different time scales, extrapolate as best you can to, to the actual effects one would see in space. And uh, Professor Rosenfeld in his uh, very nice talk the other day talked about how one can use microbeams in that, res in that respect. So to sum up, um, assessment and mitigation of space radiation risk, it's a, it's a multivariate problem. One needs to consider the radiation type and quality, the, uh, the organ of interest, um, the endpoint, cancer, central nervous system, cardiovascular system, the spacecraft design, and, um, and the mission profile, what, uh, the, the duration, duration of the mission and where you're going. Uh, so I'm gonna close now. Um, I gave a talk recently uh, um, for ASG, an ASGSR town hall, and I just picked out some relatively, uh, well, some, some recent references uh, for biology and physics, um, radio, space radiation biology and physics experiments done at various, uh, various sites. And again, you can go back in YouTube and take a look at this. Of course, they're barely representative of the hundreds, probably thousands of papers that have been done. And uh, Chris already did this for me. Thank you very much, Chris. But I want to put in a shameless plug for the journal LSSR, uh, which is a COSPAR uh, journal that, that deals with uh, both physics and biology related to life sciences in space. And uh, again, the, uh, their, their website is at the bottom. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions you have in real time. And for those of you watching this on YouTube, uh, here's my, uh, my email address, and uh, I strongly encourage you by all means to, um, to get in touch with me with any questions or any discussions you'd like to have. Thanks again. Fantastic. Thank you, Jack. That was really um, a really nice overview of the different aspects. And um, so thank you very much for putting this together. We have um, one live question, which in part you actually did answer already, but I'm just going to, because it has a second component that you may have some thoughts on as well. So the question is, um, how accurate are ground analogs in reca recapitulation or recapitulating galactic cosmic radiation in terms of quality and dose and you kind of alluded to that and is the cost to perform ground analogs versus launching CubeSats similar? Oh, cost. Um, well, okay, well, let me get the first part first. Uh, so I, I think I did answer that. They are um, in every respect except dose rate, the ground analogs have gotten quite good, especially with the mixed fields that are now being generated at NSRL. Um, but the but but dose rate is a big big limiting fact, a major limiting factor. In terms of cost, um, I can only guess at that because I don't know the, the cost for a CubeSat. But uh, but of, co of course launches are expensive, um, and even though running accelerators is expensive as well, I think they're probably my guess is that they're an order of magnitude or more uh, cheaper than uh, than launching a. Than launching a system on a CubeSat, and of course you can do a lot more biology on the ground. You're much less constrained. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're interested in NSRL, I would say go ahead and contact them. They uh, they have some limitations on uh, on who can be approved to do experiments there. Uh, beam time is fairly expensive; it's several thousand dollars an hour. Uh, I don't know the cost at GSI at HiMac. It is actually HiMac is actually free. A beam time is free to approved uh, experimenters. Um, so that's actually a very nice uh, place to, to do experiments. I think Professor Rosenfeld has worked there. Uh, mm -hmm. Our group has worked there for over 20 years. And uh, they have very nice facilities there. Their, um, their internal situation has changed some in the last couple of years. 
And I don't know if they're as, as accessible as they have been, but I certainly encourage anybody who's interested to, to get in touch with them. And if mm -hmm. uh, you go through that website or, uh, or talk to me, and I can put you in touch with, uh, uh, with their liaison staff. That's that's fantastic. Um, there was a follow up question. Um, uh, so the the um, uh, questioner is um, R P Oates. You may be familiar with this person. Um, it is uh, the second question is. It is known that there are many microgravity induced metabolic changes that happen to cells that are independent of elevated doses of uh, radiation. Do you control for microgravity and ground-based analogs? And then he specifically says, thank you also for your presentation. Uh, great, great question. Um, some experiments control, some don't. I think on the ground, uh, most experiments don't. Uh, the ones that do um, are primarily rodent experiments that do hind limb unloading. Um, uh, so that's really a limited analog in space. Uh, and this is something I, um, that I think uh, the following speakers may, may touch on, but many of the, uh, well, of course, in space, you're, you have the opposite problem. Everything is controlled for microgravity. Um, uh, so you want to, uh, so you want to control, you want to have your controls be 1G. And uh, some of the experiments in the ISS do, do that. And then, of course, they also have uh, they have ground controls to control for microgravity and radiation at the same time. If you want more details on that, I can point you to, to some references. Just uh, just shoot me an email, and I'll, I'll point you to some of the I'll point the questioner to uh, to some of the papers uh, that mm -hmm. have addressed um, uh, the interplay of microgravity and radiation. That's excellent. Um, I also um, have a question, and in terms of um, that's in terms of the shielding materials and kind of the, I guess, continuous research there. Like, like looking into the future, um, do you see you know some additional newer materials evolving there, or is there is there something that's you know maybe not not quite ready to be talked about, but something that's on the horizon, um, or just a modification of existing uh, materials that are tested you know uh, yeah to, to, to be honest there's no real magic bullet or magic shielding against the magic bullet when it comes to shielding shielding is frankly not going to be the major factor um, mm -hmm. in, uh, in designing missions um, people are always looking at, at new materials um, nanotubes filled with uh, um, with hydrogenous material for example um, but you really can't do a lot better than, uh, than basic hydrogenous materials like water and polyethylene. Mm -hmm. So uh, as for the future, I think probably the direction that, that people will go in is using resources, uh, uh, in situ resources. Um, so on the spacecraft using um, water, foodstuffs, um, the shielding of the spacecraft itself and on planetary surfaces um, using regolith directly, piling it on top of the shelter, uh, building your, um, your, locating your shelter against a cliff face, uh, or uh, maybe in a more, in more advanced uh, work, uh, using the regolith uh, combined with, um, with materials that you bring with you to design um, uh, shielding bricks. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, that's something that NASA Langley has been looked at has looked at for many years. But as far as some magic new material, uh, others may differ. But my personal opinion is that there is no magic material out there. Mm -hmm. And and how do you um, see the the chances of like yeah more drug based therapeutic based um, approaches there? I know that there are many groups working on this, but it's also I mean the 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 test subject is difficult and all of that. So just maybe from from your view of the community and I, you know, um, I'm, Chris, I'm going to mostly punt on that one because I'm not a biologist. Uh, all I can say is that there is a lot of work being done. Again, I'm aware of, of much of it, and I can I can point you or, or others to some of the papers. Um, uh, but I I don't want to. Uh, I'm not really qualified to speak to uh, to those kind of measures. 
that's that's fair. All right, I think um, if there are no other questions from the audience, um, I'm just going to say a really big thank you to Dr. Jack Miller for taking the time today for um, giving this really phenomenal presentation to us. Um, I invite everybody who's tuned in right now to go into the chat and click on the other Zoom link for the Gene Lab presentation that will follow um, uh, at the full hour um, uh, under a different uh, log in so um, please go ahead and make use of that and um, with that um, I want to thank everybody for attending and thanks again Jack for your time. It was, it was my pleasure good luck with the rest thank of the you. meeting. Looking forward to thank it. Thank you.